Ah, there we are. So uh, welcome once again to uh, our webinar, Stronger, Longer, Muscle Mass and Aging. Uh, I will uh, turn it over in just a second to Dr. Stephen Ann Ostad, co-principal investigator of the Nathan, Nathan Schock Center's Coordinating Center and the director of the Nathan Schock Center of Excellence at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. You may know that Dr. Ostad is a distinguished professor and chair of biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, as well as the scientific director of the American Federation of Aging, for Aging Research. His research explores the evolution of life histories with a particular focus on the comparative biology of aging. The science ranges from comparative demography to molecular mechanisms of aging, and he has a longtime interest in variation in both cognitive and physical aging rates among primates and other animals. He's a, uh, an excellent host for today's webinar, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Austad. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the American Federation for Aging Research's uh, webinar today. Uh, AFAR is a national nonprofit organization whose mission for many years has been to support and advance healthy aging through biomedical research. Um, this is the, this is, uh, program is supported by the National Institute on Aging, which as you know, is one of 27 institutes and centers at the NIH, and the NIA leads broad scientific effort to understand the nature of aging and to extend the healthy, active years of life, which is why we're here today. Uh, the National Institute on Aging's Go for Life is designed to help raise awareness of the importance of exercise and physical activity for adults over 50. And Next Avenue, which uh, is also uh, an important venue is a public media's first and only national journalism service for America's booming, I mean really booming 50 plus population. It delivers vital ideas, contexts, and perspectives on issues that matter most as we age. And it also uh, produces some columns by myself, I like to say. So uh, to tell you what today's uh, seminar is about, webinar is about, it's estimated that most adults will lose up to 30% of their muscle mass over the course of a lifetime, which of course means that it's important to start off with uh, a, a significant muscle mass. Today we have two experts on this topic who are really gonna tell you about two things. One, they're gonna tell you about the latest research on the age-related changes and declines in muscle mass. And they're also going to tell you, uh, give you some recommendations about how you might uh, age in a healthier way. The first of our two experts is Nathan Labrasser, who is at the Mayo Clinic. As you can see, he's a consultant, a professor, and co-chair of research in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He's also director of their Healthy Center on uh, Healthy Aging and Independent Living in the Robert and Arlene Kogod Center of Aging. Um, Dr. Labrasser has degrees in physical therapy as well as in anatomy and physiology and uh, to complete a very broad scientific background had postdoctoral studies in molecular medicine and integrative physiology at Boston Medical Center. Our other speaker uh, who, will, who will go second is uh, Lyndon Joseph. Dr. Joseph is a program officer uh, at the Division of Geriatrics and Clinical Gerontology at the National Institute on Aging. He is an exercise physiologist. Among his research interests are musculoskeletal conditions, physical function and disability, physical exercise in older adults, and anabolic agents such as testosterone. He also is interested in frailty, falls and fractures, obesity, metabolism, nutrition, and diabetes. Between these two experts today, you ought to get a real grounding in the latest what's going uh, in muscle aging and what you can do to slow it. So I will turn things over at this point to uh, Dr. Labrasser. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and uh, really appreciate the effort of uh, Go For Life, AFAR, and the National Institute on Aging to, to really put this together. And, and thanks to the support for, from Next Avenue for promoting this event. I'm really impressed by the number of participants um, that are tuned in. 
So I, I must say that uh, I, I've really had an incredibly long-standing interest in skeletal muscle, and it really started first with a fascination with human performance. And, and really, um, we've, I've been amazed simply by the fact that uh, individuals on paper who look very similar uh, uh, clearly demonstrate remarkable abilities uh, of their muscle system. But these are the messages I was trying to make about really the mark, remarkable plasticity of muscle. I won't start over here, but just, again, illustrations of, of, of really um, why I'm absolutely uh, fascinated by this incredible organ system. Again, four properties of muscle are strength, power, and endurance. So uh, right. again, John, everything's showing all right? Perfect. Okay, good, 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 good. So again, uh, in a muscle is, is more than just uh, uh, an organ that generates uh, power and force and exhibits endurance, but critically important for metabolism, as I mentioned, resilience and a new area of interest is uh, the, the premise that skeletal muscle is an important endocrine organ that can communicate with distal tissues. So it's easy to talk about uh, muscle in the context of health, but there are a number of threats that we face uh, every day in terms of maintaining muscle health. And today we're gonna to talk about aging as a major threat to the health and function of skeletal muscle. But aging often doesn't happen alone. We're often in the state of aging with chronic diseases such as heart failure and chronic kidney disease, which can drive conditions of cachexia, which is severe muscle wasting and coupled with uh, the loss of adipose tissue. In addition, as older adults, we often have interventions or hospital stays that can lead to prolonged periods of inactivity. And here is just an image of an individual after casting where you can see profound muscle loss in response to disuse. In addition, there are congenital conditions that impact muscle health. And I do wanna mention obesity uh, and the issue of lipotoxicity or the deposition of lipids within muscle that happens in the context of obesity. Today, about 30% of older adults are, are clinically obese and we're witnessing the collision of population aging with the obesity epidemic, which is posing new challenges we really never envisioned. So um, we often think of aging and, and, and disease of organ systems as a late life event, but it's important to acknowledge that skeletal muscle aging is really an er early, early, early casualty of the aging process. And this is really beautiful data from our colleague Luigi Ferrucci at the National Institute on Aging that demonstrates that as we get older, we certainly don't have issues with maintaining our body weight or, or our fat mass, but we are challenged with maintaining our lean mass. And this isn't something that happens in our 60s or our 70s, but is evident already uh, in our mid 30s. So this is really quite humbling to see that once we reach our mid 30s, we've achieved our peak skeletal muscle mass. And then we witness this progressive decline as we get older. And even though the magnitude of change doesn't appear quite as dramatic in women as it does in men, what we're quite worried about is whether or not there's a critical threshold from that consequences that we mentioned earlier. So um, it's really um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, observation here to see that the changes in muscle that occur with aging really occur quite early in life. So to describe this phenomenon of skeletal muscle aging, the term sarcopenia was coined in the late 80s by Irv Rosenberg at Tufts University. And he used this term much to reflect what we referred to in the past of osteopenia or the age-related loss in bone. And this is a Greek term that refers to poverty of the flesh from two of the Greek words, penia and sarx. And it refers now to the age-related loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. And for the past three decades, we've been meeting as a group to come up with a consensus definition of sarcopenia. This has proven somewhat challenging to get everybody on the same page, but we largely agree that sarcopenia is not just the loss of mass, but it also is also the loss of function. And as you can see here is if we take a, a cross section of the thigh of an individual and image that with an MRI, you can see that in our youth, we have robust muscle mass. So this is the hamstring musculature in your lower leg, in your mid leg, in your thigh. These are the quadricep muscles in the front of your leg. And with aging, we see the volume of those muscles dramatically reduce, um, despite this individual being the same height and weight as, as the younger woman pictured or imaged on the left. In addition to the reduction in muscle volume, you can also see the infiltration of adipose tissue 
within the muscle. And this is the marbling that you might see when you go to the grocery market and purchase a steak, but this is clearly deleterious to the health and function of muscle as we get older. In addition, you can see the thick envelope of fat under our skin that surrounds the muscle is increasing with advancing age. With a CT scan, we can see that it's not just the quantity of muscle, but it's also the quality of muscle that's changing with advancing age. And here with the CT imaging, you can look at the density of muscle and this lighter green color and the orange colors and the pink colors show lower quality of muscle. And again, the infiltration of adipose tissue with advancing age within skeletal muscle. So again, in addition to muscle mass changing with advancing age, there's also a concern about advancing uh, alterations in muscle function. Before I get to that, I'll just show you in a little bit more detail what happens with aging in muscle. So we see an atrophy of the muscle fibers. These are the cells that make up skeletal muscle. And it's that atrophy or the shrinkage that re results in a, a reduction in mass. In addition to the atrophy of fibers, we see actual fiber loss. And this is death of the fibers through various different biological mechanisms, perhaps even due to the loss of nerve supply or capillaries within muscle as we age. And as a result, we see a reduction again in, in muscle mass as we get older. Muscle tissue is often replaced again by fatty tissue and fibrosis. So when we look at older muscle of individuals, whether it be humans or animals, we see the quality of muscle being compromised by the infiltration of fat as well as fibrotic tissue. When we talk about function in aging, the most common measures we use to look at skeletal muscle function are measures of strength. And here's a very simple example of hand grip strength and changes across the life course, where you can see much like changes in mass, we see peak strength occurring really in kind of the late 20s to early 30s, and then a progressive decline over the course of our uh, adulthood. And I want to mention that these declines in strength are far in excess of what we lose in mass. Again, reflecting on not just the loss of mass, which is critical to healthy aging, but also the loss in muscle quality. So we're seeing that the loss in strength far out, out seats, uh, exceeds the loss in mass. Gait speed is another common measure that we use to look at muscle function uh, across the lifespan. And here you can see that usual gait speed, so just the time that takes you to walk a short distance of four meters, dramatically declines with advancing age. Again, this is data from Luigi Ferrucci from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. And you can see here that in our 60s or even our 50s, we start to see this progressive decline in our gait speed. This is a reflection in part of muscle health, but also muscles integration with other organ systems such as our, our, our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system and our cardiovascular system and likely our pulmonary system. So collectively, this is a very good readout of, of health as we age. The impact of sarcopenia is really quite profound. And, and this is a, an estimate that was generated many years ago now. But when we combine the effects of low muscle mass with this impact on strength, power, and endurance, and ultimately its impact on function, things like mobility and gait, collectively, these are the major drivers of falls in late life, our loss of independence, our disability, our institutionalization, which means really our ability to live independently versus having to move into an assisted living type of situation. And it's even a strong predictor of death in later life. So the impact of sarcopenia is really quite profound. And again, many years ago now was estimated about $19 billion per year. Despite the unmet need of sarcopenia, there's really been a challenge to get enthusiasm and energy amongst the pharmaceutical industry to target this as an important unmet medical need. Um, a number of strategies have been discussed, but it really wasn't until 2016 that sarcopenia received a diagnosis code through the ICD-10 mechanism to identify it as a treatable disease. In the, in the absence of having a disease to treat, there's really little enthusiasm for the private industry to go after this as an important health outcome amongst older adults. A number of different strategies have been attempted. Some of these have been strictly targeting uh, the stimulation of protein synthesis or muscle growth. So trying to get muscle mass to increase in older adults. And that has included interventions that include growth factors, uh, uh, androgens such as testosterone 
for selective androgen receptor modulators, which try to avoid some of the adverse effects of, of androgens, as well as nutritional supplementation. So things like protein supplements and essential amino acids that can sometimes be deficient in older adults and, and lead to muscle loss uh, with advancing age. On the other side of the equation are strategies to prevent protein degradation and muscle atrophy. And these have included interventions to stimulate appetite, or what we call orexigenic agents, as well as anti-inflammatories. So we often talk about inflammation and aging. The fact that we have this subtle storm in the background, the smoldering fire in the absence of infection, but we have heightened levels of inflammatory factors that can lead to the catabolism or breakdown of muscle tissue. What we're gonna talk a little bit more about today are some of the anti-catabolic approaches. And these include uh, targeting factors that promote muscle breakdown, such as myostatin, um, and this is a protein that I'll talk about next. But collectively, these have all been different approaches to try to improve muscle health in older adults. And unfortunately today, there are no approved compounds. And part of this is due to the lack of efficacy. And it's also due to many of these compounds having off-target effects and having concern, concerns about safety. So myostatin has generated great interest in the scientific community. It was discovered in the mid 90s by Sage and Lee at Johns Hopkins. And I know this isn't a pretty picture, but it really illustrates the point that if we genetically delete myostatin from a mouse in the laboratory, we get a very clear phenotype. And that phenotype is a remarkable doubling of skeletal muscle mass. So on the left hand side here, if we peel back the fur of a mouse, you can see the muscle tissue in the arm. And you can see it's, it's, it's quite impressive. But in the absence of myostatin in this animal, it has a doubling of muscle mass, so huge muscles throughout the body. And this isn't just something that's unique to laboratory animals. If we look in nature, there are several examples of naturally occurring mutations in the myostatin gene that impair myostatin's ability to regulate muscle mass. And when we take the breaks off of muscle growth, you see, again, hypermuscularity here in the Belgian blue cow a very robust and strong looking animal. I'm not sure how it tastes, but it's, um, it's clearly a, a mutation that leads to a hypermuscular phenotype. What captured, captured the interest of many of us in the field trying to identify ways to improve muscle function is the story of the Whippet race dog. And on the left hand side of my screen, you can see three dogs that are normal Whippet race dogs have normal levels of myostatin. On the far right are three dogs that have a complete, um, what's called a homozygous mutation in myostatin. And they literally have zero circulating uh, myostatin to regulate muscle mass. And in the absence of myostatin, these animals get so muscular that it really compromises function. They're so muscle bound, they have difficulty running. While the animals on the left have normal levels of myostatin, they can still run about 30 miles per hour. They're incredibly fast animals. But what's encouraging is that the, animal, the, the dogs in the middle column here, the three dogs here, have about half the levels of nor, uh, normal levels of myostatin. And this alteration in their physiology leads to a slightly hypermuscular phenotype, as you can see in the images, but it also confers an improvement in function. And what I mean by that is that compared to these animals that run 30 miles per hour, these animals can run about 50% faster. They're in the 40 mile per hour range. It's really quite impressive. And this is encouraging because it means that we don't need to get rid of myostatin from an older adult to potentially have beneficial effects on function, but we can just knock down myostatin with different approaches to improve their performance. It's also worth noting that there have been naturally occurring mutations in the myostatin gene in humans. And this is a story from 2004, and there were just concerns about following this child um, over a long period of time. But even at this time of the study, this individual exhibited uh, marked muscle hypertrophy or large muscles in the lower limbs. He also exhibited marked strength, um, and, and it really provided some encouragement and excitement that myostatin may be a very viable strategy to improve muscle health in aging adults. So the strategy to do this has been relatively straightforward where myostatin um, signals through a receptor on muscle to activate pathways involved in muscle growth and muscle atrophy. And through its primary effector molecule, 
which is the SMAD signaling network, it turns off pathways involved in muscle growth. So we don't need to know the details here, but what's interesting about myostatin is that it simultaneously turns off muscle growth or, or protein synthesis and translation to drive muscle hypertrophy and inhibits muscle atrophy. I'm sorry, it stimulates muscle atrophy and, and stimulates uh, protein degradation. So myostatin plays a role in reducing muscle size. It's probably been developed evolutionarily to kind of keep muscle from getting too big. So we know how to regulate our organ uh, sizes. And pharmacologically, the approach has been quite straightforward and that's been either to inhibit the myostatin protein itself or to devise strategies to block its receptor so it can no longer inhibit muscle growth or drive muscle atrophy. So those are the two approaches. Um, in preclinical models, and we don't have time to go through this, these are largely models uh, in mice. It's been clear that strategies to inhibit myostatin signaling have a profound effect on muscle mass, even in aged animals. We've done studies in 24-month-old mice, and we can see that just um, short-term administration of these drugs can increase muscle mass by more than 20%. And those have translated improvements in function, whether we measure muscle strength or gait speed. It improves body composition, increasing lean mass and decreasing fat mass and improving measures of metabolism common measures that we perform in humans with obesity or type 2 diabetes. And really impressively is by increasing muscle mass through these interventions, we can improve the resilience of older organisms to infections and different cancers that we may um, uh, uh, challenge them with. In addition to improving the health of muscle, what's really been impressive is that improvements in muscle mass through the myostatin intervention have translated improvements in the health of other organs. So we actually see better cardiac function in older animals that we've treated with these interventions. We see improved bone health. We see lower kind of steatosis, which is kind of fatty infiltration and fibrosis of the liver. And we can even see better functioning of blood vessels in animal models of atherosclerosis. So based on all these preclinical findings, really in kind of the 2000s and um, early two, uh, 2010s, uh, there was great excitement about translating these strategies that were showing, showing great promise at the bench, bringing them to the bedside to see if they can improve and impact human health. So a few trials have been performed in humans. I'm just going to give you data from two that um, jump out. One is the use of uh, an, an, uh, a drug that targets the receptor for myostatin. This is the ACTAR2B receptor. And the study recruited individuals with low muscle mass defined by a DEXA scan, which gives you a sense of body composition. And these individuals also had slow gait speed. So if we looked at them walk over a short course, it was just a timed walking test to see that their gait speed was below uh, one meter per second. In addition to that, um, they were divided into two groups. There was about 20 individuals assigned to a placebo group and 20 individuals assigned to the drug group. The drug was administered just once for most of the subjects, but half the subjects received another dose at day uh, 56. And what you can see here is that the myostatin approach really did drive improvements in muscle mass. So this is an MRI measurement of muscle volume, and you can see about a six to 8% increase in muscle volume in those who received the drug, whereas those in the placebo group really showed no change uh, as you would expect. When measures of strength were examined, it was more difficult to see changes. And part of this reflects the learning effect of performance-based measures in clinical trials. So the more times we ask individuals to do these tests, they show improvement. We see a slight improvement those, of, of those individuals on the drug um, that was statistically significant at a few of the time points. And when drug kind of wore off over time, again, and it has a half-life of about 30 days uh, later in the, the follow-up period um, that was gone. When walking distance was examined, and this is maybe the most important outcome measure that we can use to get clearance and approval from the FDA, here was a little bit more disappointing news. When all individuals were looked at combined, there was no difference, unfortunately, between the placebo group and the group receiving the drug. However, when individuals were looked at based on their baseline abilities, what I'm showing you here with the red um, bracket is that those at baseline that had the worst physical performance, meaning they, could walk, they couldn't walk 300 meters over the course of six minutes, those individuals who were most impaired and received the drug 
showed the greatest improvement in their physical function uh, in response to the drug, suggesting that those who are most impaired in later life in terms of muscle health and physical function respond best to the intervention. In another study with a slightly different approach to block myostatin signaling, this is a drug from Lilly. This was subcutaneous injections of the drug once a month. Um, I'm sorry, this is for about five months, not, not uh, five weeks. Um, you can see here, again, using a slightly different measure of muscle mass, that those that received the drug had improvements in muscle mass, not dramatic. This is in kilograms, so this is just about a pound of muscle that was added in response to the injections. And these individuals um, who were on drug showed slight improvements in the time it took them to climb uh, stairs. So a downward trend here is a positive change, meaning it took less time to climb a flight of stairs. And they also demonstrated slight improvements in gait speed. However, these changes are not that robust. And, um, and there's been some discouragement how changes in muscle mass have not necessarily translated in improvements in muscle function. So overall, um, this is a bit of a harsh um, summary of, of kind of the research in the myostatin field, but there's a bit of a, a loss in translation scenario where the short-term interventions that have been tested have exhibited moderate effects on muscle mass, but really quite limited effects on measures of function. And the difficulty with this is that the FDA has made it quite clear that we're not able to simply show improvements in muscle mass, but the interventions that we develop have to show improvements in skeletal muscle function. And for the most part, most trials have used gait speed as that readout. And unfortunately, that hasn't changed with the trial designs that have been tested so, full, so far. I do think that there is still some hope in the sense that in both of these studies, individuals who exhibited the, the worst muscle health at baseline had the best response to the interventions. Um, the challenge for us in academic research or even in, in industry-related research these individuals are difficult to recruit and retain in clinical trials um, that we perform. It's also important to highlight that in the preclinical studies that we've been involved in, that there's no question that these drugs work best when they're combined with a nutritional and exercise program. Now, it's clear, um, and you'll hear more about this from Dr. Joseph, that exercise have, has profound effects that far exceed the effects of an individual drug. Um, and this is really important information for most of us to retain. However, it poses some challenges as we think about the design and execution of clinical trials to test efficacy. So for myostatin anyways, the future is unfortunately a bit uncertain at this stage. I do wanna comment uh, briefly on the fact that we're in a very new era today, and that's this era of geroscience, where we're thinking about strategies not just for individual diseases, but the idea of targeting diseases as a group. And this is really based on our incredible advances in understanding the biology of aging. And geroscience really refers to the idea of intervening on the biology of aging, not to simply uh, impact one condition of aging, but to delay the onset of age-related diseases as a group. And this is where there's incredible uh, momentum right now in our field, thanks to organizations like AFAR and the National Institute on Aging. And I just wanna make a brief comment before handing this over to uh, Dr. Joseph, about what we're thinking about in this space. So when we think about aging, it's a very practical question to ask, what is aging? And we simply define aging now as the accumulation of molecular and cellular damage. So this is damage to the instruction manuals in our cell or our DNA. It's damage to the organelles within our cells that provide energy for biological processes and those are the mitochondria. It's pollution within our cells or oxidative stress. It's the accumulation of old and damaged proteins. So the garbage disposal within our cells no longer function properly when we aggregate old dysfunctional proteins. Uh, it's sterile inflammation. Again, the smoldering fire that causes uh, harm on the health and function of various tissues. And there's also a process of cellular senescence that we've been incredibly interested in where kind of the rotten apples or bad cells within our bodies accumulate and, and provide a toxic environment for the health and function of, of neighboring cells. And now that we're at a point that we've advanced our understanding of the biology of aging, the big question is, can we intervene? Can we intervene with drugs, diets, exercise, cells, genetic therapies to target the biology of aging? And the excitement here 
is not based on designing better drugs to simply build stronger muscle or better bones or improve insulin sensitivity or improve heart function, but intervening on aging to delay the onset of age-related diseases as a group and ultimately minimize disability and frailty in late life and, and uh, minimize functional decline. And clearly there are a number of trials now underway, one supported by AFAR, testing the effects of metformin in older adults. Other groups around the country are testing the effects of rapamycin, and we're testing the effects of senolytics at Mayo Clinic and other places to see how these interventions that target the biology of aging impact the health of multiple organ systems and, and skeletal muscle in particular. I would also highlight that as we contemplate interventions to promote healthy aging, there's nothing better than exercise. And it's very clear now through many studies by uh, uh, multiple groups that exercise can actually counter the majority of forms of age-related molecular and cellular damage. We know that exercise can augment DNA repair. It can actually stabilize telomeres within cells. It augments mitochondrial function. It counters oxidative stress. It stimulates protein degradation of old and damaged proteins. It quenches sterile inflammation and it can also prevent cellular senescence. So exercise is really um, is, <laughs> is the recommendation that we're gonna have today, and, and Dr. Joseph will, will um, clarify more of my point on that here in just a second. And I'll just end by saying that we're really in a new era of science and medicine. It's an incredibly exciting time that this new approach of targeting the biology of aging is very different than what we've been doing to date by targeting diseases and believing that aging is not modifiable. That's dramatically changed. We have plenty of evidence now in a number of different species to suggest we can do just that. It's important to note that interventions targeting the effects of aging hold promise for extending human health span. So this is a new buzzword that many of us are using, not talking about lifespan, but talking about the active, productive, and healthy years of life that we had hoped to extend and delay the onset of age-related conditions as a group and compress morbidity in the, to the very end of life. Um, and while it's early, our preclinical studies and some of our first in human trials suggest that the interventions targeting the biology of aging will positively affect skeletal muscle health and physical function. So with that, um, I'll, I'll thank everyone for their attention. I apologize for the technical difficulties and I'll hand it over to Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Dr. Labrasser. Uh, Dr. Joseph, um, uh, please continue. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, Nathan, uh, for that uh, talk on myostatin. And so, um, <clears throat> so now I, I get to cover, my task was to actually talk about exercise and, and the, some of the studies that NIA has funded that looked at the effects of exercise on, on muscle mass and function. And, and, and just so you know, you, you know, this has been around for a while. Um, everybody knows that exercise is important for you. And as Hippocrates says, you know, um, Eating is good, food is good, but you must also take exercise because the combination of food and exercise, those separate, those, those separate does, does um, work together to, to produce perfect health or good health. Um, but even though we know exercise is good, the problem is that we really can't get the public to exercise uh, frequently at all. And what this graph is showing that um, as, we get, as we get older, there's an increase in sedentary behavior. And that increase in sedentary behavior it's pretty significant and it, it ends up to about you know nine hours of waking time in center behavior so when we combine the the center behavior of these old individuals with the loss in muscle as as nathan just talked about what we see is a pretty um drastic change in function and performance as the individual age um and what that results to is that we have difficulty rising from a chair climbing stairs problems with gait and walking speed and which all increase their risk for falls um, <clears throat> and independence as, 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 as Nathan mentioned. And what we also realized too is that there's a problem improving skeletal health. I, mean, I know this is about muscle mass, but you know, as, as, as an aging um, program officer, you really can't separate, to me, you can't separate them at all. You have to think about muscle health, bone health, and also overall body composition. So what we're looking at in, in the end is the muscle quality and how it affects performance. And, and muscle size and composition are uh, affected with age and, and, and this mobility limitation or center behavior, as I mentioned earlier. Um, why is that important? It's important because, you know, about 
over 29 million people living in the community right now, they have a problem walking a quarter mile or 400 meters. And of that percentage, about 13 million can't perform the activity at all. And, and that leaves a, a strong burden on the community in terms of hospitalization or nursing home residents. And not only for walking, we also see a problem with um, activities of daily living, just going, moving around the house, getting dressed, um, going to the grocery store. Um, about, almost 40% of people over 65 has problems doing activities of daily living. And of that, 39%, um, 11 million have severe difficulty doing it. So they need um, caregiving issues. And, and again, as I mentioned, um, creates a burden on the society or from the healthcare services perspective. Um, but the good thing about it is that we have funded some studies over the years that have shown that um, exercise, whether or not it be aerobic strength or combination of both, um, has significantly improved the mobility of these individuals, their quality of life, their function. And I cannot mention anything at all with exercise in older individuals without mentioning this story. The landmark study that was done by Marriott, Maria Fialaroni, and Bill Evans, and the group at uh, the Hebrew Rehab, uh, Lou Lipschitz. And what they did was basically took frail old individuals over 90 years old. I think the oldest was 98 in this group. It was a small pilot study, but what they did, they decided to stress these individuals, to really challenge them. Instead of doing these this light hand weights that you usually see in these nursing home um, classes, they decided to actually um, do a progressive resistance training, which a lot of exercise physiologists and physical therapists know about. You get a one RM and you stress them at anywhere from 60 to 80% of their one RM. And after eight weeks on that program, what you see here is a significant change in muscle mass, overall muscle mass. And when you break it down by the quadriceps or the hamstring muscles, it's an overall improvement in muscle mass. But more importantly, what you saw was a significant improvement in gait speed and 174% improvement in strength. So not only did they gain more muscle, they actually improved their overall muscle function so they could walk faster and their strength increased. So there's an increase in power which, as I mentioned, that the mobility disability is an issue with these individuals. So if you expose them to a strength training program, that's been very effective. The problem here is that not everybody can go to a gym um, to do this progressive resistance training. And so what we wanted to see was whether or not we come up with a more translatable intervention, um, which is uh, ask these individuals to start walking, do brisk walking, do uh, strength training, low, low strength training, by using more like um, ankle weights, uh, do some balance and flexibility testing. We then sponsored what we call a live trial. This was a pilot study of about 300 individuals at eight centers just to see whether or not uh, doing a, a translatable program would actually improve the function of these old individuals. The, the group here was about 17 to 70 to 90 years old again, about 300 individuals. And after six weeks of doing this, this combined intervention, what they saw was an improvement in the SPV scores. The SPV is a functional measure, as you know, some of you are aware of, that looks at gait speed, shear rise, and tandem balance. And what you saw after six months was a significant improvement in the, in the SPPB, in the, in the activity group, whereas in the, this, what we call a successful agent, they just basically usual care. They, they, there, was, there was a slight change, but there was really wasn't significant, but a significant difference between the physical activity and the successful agent group. And if you follow them for another six month period, you see that the, the difference still remained. The interesting thing about this is that they then followed them for <clears throat> three years. And this time they're looking at walking speed here, um, gait speed. And the, the, the red here, if that's what you've seen on your screen, is the physical activity group. And you see there's a the slight bump in gait speed and it maintained it over three years, as long as they maintain the activity that they were prescribed. Whereas the successful agent group had a decrease in their walking speed. As they mentioned, this change in function is, is the risk that leaves a lot of risk for adverse events, nursing home admissions, falls. But so what we see here is that from this live trial, um, that's, that's a more of a, a doable intervention. You see a significant change in function with these individuals. So what this led then is to do a larger scale trial with about 1,600 individuals to see whether or not we can implement this on a larger scale. And in this case, the outcome here was what we call mobility disability, which is the ability to walk 400 meters. As I mentioned earlier, quite a 24 million people cannot walk 400 meters at all. And so you expose them to the intervention and you try to see whether or not you, you have a difference in the, 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 the <clears throat> sorry, 
the difference in, in mobility disability between the two and the two groups. And what you saw here was an 18% reduction over the three year follow up period in the group that, uh, were, were, that were exposed to the activity versus the group that was not. And not only do you have an 80% reduction in, in the major mobility disability, but for what we call persistent disability, you had a 28% reduction. So people were going back and forth between being, being uh, having disability and not having the disability. But once you expose them to the intervention, they actually stayed um, active throughout the, the three year period. Um, so, so what's the reason for that? Well, uh, let me back up here. So what they also did was they wanted to make sure these guys were actually doing so they put um, accelerometer in them. Because you know, when you ask people to see how active you are, everybody say, yeah, I'm doing things, but a lot of times they're really not doing it. So the activities just show that they, they, they were doing the activity. Um, but what was important about this is that they looked at some muscle measures. And what it's showing you is that the activity group here had, uh, uh, there was some slight decrease in muscle, but you can see the decrease is a lot less compared to the normal group. The change in the muscle area <clears throat> subcutaneous fat area, uh, sub, sub, subcutaneous adipose tissue was a lot more in the activity group. The intramuscular adipose tissue, which Nathan mentioned earlier, as you can see, there's a, there's a difference between the successful aging and the physical activity group. And then the muscle quality, they're looking at torque, is the, the performance of the muscle. You can see the physical activity group had a, a smaller reduction in the, the peak torque of the muscle. So being active in this older age group was very significant in preventing the mobility disabilities that we see with older individuals. Um, in addition to that, you know, as an aging um, person, you really want to see that there's an overall improvement in, in, the, in the person. And what we noticed is that there was a, a reduction in falls, serious falls in this group after the intervention, uh, fracture, which is a big thing in these older individuals, uh, because when they, they fall, they can't respond quick enough to the, to the to perturbation, so they end up falling, They're trying to brace, the, brace themselves with the fall and a fraction of hip or the wrist or, or having a brain injury. And um, hospitalization, uh, there's a 59% reduction. So not only that we have improvement in body composition and, and quality of life, we also have some significant um, benefits in terms of other adverse events that you see when people age and they age and they become mobile, um, um, disabled as they get age, as they age, sorry. Um, so that's in, in individuals who are quote unquote, you know, normal, normal um, body composition. What happens to the group of people who we are calling sarcopenic, um, who have sarcopenic obesity, which is, as, as Nathan mentioned, about 30% of this population are obese. And so there's problems with being, being mobile. Um, not only that, they have loss of muscle, they have a lot of chronic conditions as well, and I'll talk about that later. And so this group here, um, Dennis Villarreal in Texas, was very much interested in that. And he did an earlier pilot study to look at the effect of the calorie restriction alone versus the resistance training. And why he saw that there was, um, for a 10% weight loss, um, there was a significant attenuation of change in, in this case, what I'm showing here is, 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 a, is um, BMD, hip. Um, it, what I'm showing here is I, I'm not showing the, the calorie restriction only group, but I'm showing the control group that had no intervention, no weight loss versus aerobic training, resistance training, and a combination of both. And what you see here was that the resistance training and the combination of the resistance and aerobic training had a significant attenuation of the change in bone density, which is a good thing, which is what we really want to see because a lot of geriatricians are concerned of putting these old individuals on a weight loss program because not only you have a significant change in body composition or body fat, you also have a change in muscle mass and bone. Um, this next slide show you what's happening in terms of lean muscle mass and, and graph C here. Um, in, the, in the aerobic group, you, you, there was a change in, there was a decrease in, in lean mass um, but this decrease is not as much as you as if you were on a, a calorie restriction only, right? But when you look at the resistance and the combination group, you see a significant decrease in, in, in signal attenuation of decrease in lean muscle mass. Uh, but what's most striking though is that the we talk about the quality of the muscle, and so what you see here on the right, which is D, is that there's significant improvement in strength even though you saw some, some decrease in muscle mass. So it's not only in muscle mass, it's how does the muscle perform, as, as, as Dr. Labrasse mentioned earlier, the quality of the muscle, the force that's produced, the resistance to fatigue, all right? And so what you see here is that after the intervention, there's a significant improvement in strength in the aerobic resistance training combination group. And more importantly, in the top two graphs is you see the change in function. 
This is a PPT, is a physical function test where they do a four meter walk, a chair stand, um, you know, picking up a penny from the ground. And you see the aerobic group has a significant improvement in performance, resistance training, and the combination had a, a, an additive effect. And uh, for the functional quality score measures, it was the same thing. So exposing these individuals to an intervention that's, that's translatable results in some significant improvement in not only strength, but also their function and in fact, the quality of life. Um, what happens, as Nathan mentioned, you know, people are very much interested in supplements and how the supplements work. Um, this is a study by um, Roger Fielding's group. Um, and, uh, and I think Nathan is probably smiling because he's probably aware of this study. Maybe he was doing, uh, on, <laughs> involved in that study when he was in Boston. But what they decided to do here was to combine the exercise. And this exercise, again, is a chance level exercise from the life study, which is just walking, strength, balance, and flexibility with the supplementation. And in this case, they gave uh, whey protein, 20 grams, vitamin D, and, and, and a multivitamin. And just wanted to see these old individuals, is there an additive effect with the exercise and the supplement. And what you're seeing here is, is the, 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 the benefits are tremendous with the active group. What you see is this, this normal density of the muscle here, which is the, the, you know, the pure muscle um, fibers. You see an improvement in that. And the low density, which is the one that's, as Nathan showed, the, the, you saw the marbling, the, the, the intra, intramyocellular fat, you saw a decrease in that with the supplement group. Whereas the group that, that exercised, it, there was no significant change, which is a good thing. But well, when you have the supplement, you have a little added benefits. Um, <clears throat> and when you look at the intermuscular fat, what you see is a significant decrease in, in muscular fat with the exercise and the supplement. And you saw a significant decrease in muscular fat with the exercise as well. So, it, um, so exercise alone by itself is beneficial. And when you add the supplement, you see a beneficial change in, in muscle quality. Um, so uh, as, as, as an exercise physiologist and somebody who is concerned about overall health of the individual. I know this is about muscle mass, but I, I, I would be remiss if I don't mention the positive metabolic effect of people involved in exercise and, or lifestyle modification. Okay? And a lot of you are probably aware of the, um, the, the diabetes prevention study. And what they did in this case is they combined their three groups. They had a lifestyle group, which was uh, about 7% weight loss. And they told them to really get some brisk walking under 50 minutes a week. And they compare that to a metformin group and a placebo group. At baseline, these people were pre-diabetic, so they're glucose intolerant. And they track the, the, the time in, in which they become full-blown diabetics. And as you can see, the lifestyle group outperformed both the metformin, the metformin group, which is the, the uh, um, first line of treatment for diabetics. And as you can see, the placebo, you know, had a significant effect. The interesting thing about this, when NIA decided to co-sponsor this, we decided to tell them to increase the older age, the older age group in this, in this cohort. And they did that. And what it showed was that you had a significant effect in the older group, the group 60 and above. And this is the group that, as you can see here in the lifestyle, that for, for every 100 case of, of becoming diabetic, you only had three in the lifestyle group. Whereas in the metformin, it, it was triple of that. So a lifestyle intervention, just being physically active, um, include some strength training if you can, um, is definitely beneficial in not only improving muscle mass and function, but improving a lot of metabolic control because with these only individuals, there are a lot of cro cro chronic conditions. They have diabetes, they have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and exercise overall has a beneficial effect on all these qualities. Um, so what's happening overall? Um, and, and this is just showing uh, when I was a postdoc at the University of Maryland, we had a lot of individuals come into for our studies. We had athletes, we had masters athletes, young athletes, older individuals. And what we decided to do was to basically look at the body composition of the person overall. And what you see here, um, just taking this graph right here, is a 50 to 70 year old athlete and compare the, in, the percent fat with the young group and the older group. As you can see, significant decrease in body fat. Not only significant decrease in body fat, but a significant decrease in intra-abdominal body fat as well. So the more active you are, the less intra-abdominal fat you have. Um, and when you compare that to an older young person, so a 40 to 50 year old is physically active, basically have the body composition of a young, spry college age student, and that's beneficial. And not only is it is it in the overall body, we were talking, we've been talking about muscle mass, and Nathan showed you something like this earlier on. What is shown here is the difference between a trained and a sedentary older person, same BMI um, as Nathan mentioned earlier. But what I want to ha Nathan highlighted this earlier: the increase in subcutaneous muscle fat, the 
shrinking of the muscle. But here is the intramuscular fat that you see in the muscle. Now, this is good in a restaurant, but for, for performance perspective, for an old individual, that's not good. But what I'm showing you here is that exercise is beneficial from that perspective. Um, so what, we, what do we want to do? Um, is uh, what we're showing here is that we have a, a significant increase in sedentary behavior as we age, but we want, we want to change this, have people increase their light activity. For the moderate to vigorous activity, it's, it's pretty slim, about 11 minutes, minutes per um, <coughs> hold it for, for individuals. We want to increase that a little bit more. So decrease the sedentary time, increase the light activity, and in, probably increase the moderate to vigorous activity. And the reason for doing that is because we know right now Exercise is probably the only thing that's improving physical function, preventing disability in old individuals. So if exercise was a pill, we'd be prescribing that. Um, and so what I want to leave you with is, is basically this. We want you to sit less, walk more, and do some moderate to vigorous active structured exercise uh, these, at least 10 to 30 minutes per day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joseph. Um, I think we can stay on a little bit of extra time to take some questions. I think that uh, I'm going to have to leave shortly, but I think John uh, Bielinson can take some of the questions. I'd like to start off maybe with one question, and then I'll, I'll, unfortunately I'll have to leave you. But several people have asked, are there types of, uh, of exercises that are better for men versus women or better for younger people versus older people, or are all exercises equally good and 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 thanks to you both and i'm i'm sorry i'm going to have to leave but i'll look forward uh dr labrasser do you want to take that one first sure steve so th there's um this is a common question that we receive when we talk about the benefits of exercise i think there's a couple of distinctions to make one is is you know lyndon did a nice job discriminating between physical activity and exercise. So when we talk about physical activity, this is just day-to-day -day activity, getting up and about, moving around and about, doing activity of daily living. Um, there's benefits to more vigorous activity of daily living, like uh, cutting your grass or, or cleaning your house, but, but that's physical activity. When we talk about exercise and getting uh, regular exercise, we're talking about structured exercise. And that, of course, comes in many different flavors. There are clear benefits for our cardiovascular system through aerobic exercise, so cycling, walking, swimming, endurance type activities. But when we're talking about maintaining muscle health, it's clear that we need to get some resistance training into that program. Um, and and that's, that's absolutely essential. And as, as Lyndon said, having older adults exercise at a relatively high intensity is very important for promoting muscle health and, and um, you know working with physical therapists or if you can identify a skilled trainer to uh, design a program that that really targets um, higher intensity resistance training is, is really important there is also some strong evidence for the high intensity interval training to, to drive some benefits um, and that's these kind of high intense periods of exercise followed by short recovery um, and repeated several times. And, and, and that's one kind of area that we're, we're increasingly interested in because again, um, we, we all have limited time to, <laughs> to get these things done. Um, but, so I, I hope that helps. I, I don't have a strong opinion about differences between men and women. There are certainly areas um, you know, that, that may require some special attention. So there's a lot of benefits to Kegel type exercise for, for the pelvic floor area in women as they get older. Uh, but for optimizing physical function, gait, um, and things of that nature, uh, you know, there's, 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 I don't think there's a, a major difference between what we recommend to women versus men. Dr. Joseph, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I know. I, I think Nathan hit it on the head. Um, you know, the, the thing that I, I usually tell people is, you know, you do, you do what you can do. And, and as, you, as Nathan said, find somebody who can help you to, 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 to maintain this, this exercise over a long period of time. Um, the, 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 there, there's some, I don't have a strong opinion between men and women either, but there are some studies out there that showed, that shows, you know, especially aerobic exercise, men and women do respond differently, for example, for endothelial function. And it, there's some indication that women might have to exercise at high intensity. Um, in terms of muscle mass or muscle um, protein synthesis, there's some uh, 
um, I, I, like Eleanor Volpe's group in Texas has shown that you know um, the protein synthesis rate is different between young and old, and so they might they might have to exercise it differently out of the high intensity. But the goal here though is to get people to get people moving and get them exercising because as you can see, it's not only benefit to the muscles, benefit as Nathan said to the cardiovascular system, to the pulmonary system, to the, the vascular system, and so being active. Uh, is beneficial overall. So just try to get, try to do something and, and make it something that you can maintain for a longer period. As you become more and more fit, you can probably increase the intensity because the, 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 the higher the intensity, the more benefits you see. And as, as Nathan mentioned, there are a lot of other um, uh, interventions out there that I didn't mention. And my apologies to the ones that I didn't mention because of the time frame. You mentioned the high intensity training. Um, another one that's, that, that's sort of gathering steam is this um, blood pressure restricted resistance training. So there, there are different types of exercise out there. I always caution people to do the ones that you think you're comfortable doing, one that you can maintain for a longer period of time. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joseph. I am going to turn things over to John Bielinson now to finish with the questions. I'd like to thank both Dr. LaBrasseur and Dr. Joseph for, for joining us. And uh, John, uh, um, please take over and thanks everybody for joining us. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Osted, for, uh, for, for being with us today. Uh, we do have a number of questions, and uh, uh, hopefully Dr. Lebrasseur and, and, and Dr. Joseph can stay with us for a little while longer as we uh, answer some of those questions. Um, there are a number of questions, uh, particularly around increasing muscle mass, um, about sort of what are the best ways to increase muscle mass and the best ways for an individual to monitor changes in muscle mass without going to the, the laboratory. I was wondering if one or both of you, again, these are sort of more sort of uh, questions focused on uh, sort of lay concerns, but we're wondering if there are things that you can uh, tell us about that. Dr. Joseph, maybe you want to start or? Uh, sure, sure, I'll start. In terms of muscle mass, um, as Nathan mentioned, uh, you're going to have to stress the muscle. You're going to have to progressively increase the load on the muscle to increase the muscle mass. People who are sedentary, who have been sedentary for quite some time, once they start working out, uh, start becoming physically active, there is a slight increase in muscle mass, but it's, it's not to any significant amount. If you want a significant increase in muscle mass, you're going to have to do some strength training, um, you know, and, and, in, and, and at a high resistance. Still. Um, there's no other way that I know of at the moment uh, to increase muscle mass unless you're, you're taking some anabolic uh, increased muscle mass. But um, we, 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 we like to, as an exercise physiologist, just stay away from that and, and do uh, strength training. Right. Nathan? Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, muscle mass is very important, but when we initiate resistance training, even in younger individuals, during the first probably eight weeks, most of the adaptations that occur are neuromuscular. So we're getting better recruitment of the existing muscle. And it's after that period that we start to see changes in mass. So um, the most important thing that you can do through resistance training, yes, there's benefits to increasing mass, but making muscle uh, of higher quality uh, is really the, the goal. And I think to monitor yourself, the best monitoring you can do is to make sure that you're um, the, the amount of weight that you're using in your exercise is increasing. I've seen a couple of questions about um, TheraBands and use of bands versus free weights. Some of that relates to safety, but what I like about either the, the using free weights or the machines within a, a fitness center is that you can gauge your progress. And, and seeing progress means, number one, that you're improving the quality of muscle, the ability to activate that muscle, and ultimately it means you're increasing the size of that muscle. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Uh, how much of a role does genetics play uh, in the plasticity of muscle as we age uh, in terms of uh, perhaps uh, variations in our, and the ability of, of the body to respond to, these, uh, to these, these exercise and other inputs? Yeah, I, I would say that genetics plays a, a small role. Um, in most things that we look at, genetics explains no more than 20-ish percent of the variance um, in response to, uh, you know, or for risk for diseases or in response to interventions. For muscle, some of us may have uh, muscle types that tend to be more responsive to things like resistance training, and we can generate more strength, while others may have more of an endurance phenotype. So I used kind of the that the power lifter and the runner as the two extremes of that, most of us, um, for better or worse, are in the middle somewhere. And, and, and we can train our body to adapt to one, one of those extremes or the other, but we, 
how far we can move the needle may be somewhat dictated by genetics. Right. Uh, Dr. Joshua, anything you want to add? Or, uh... No, no, I think yeah. it's nail on the head. Um, in, right. in terms of the fiber stuff, you know, it's, it's the, uh, if we look at the type 1 versus type 2 fibers, some, you know, some people are genetically predisposed to have more type 2 fibers and some have more type 1 mm -hmm. fibers. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't strength train if you have type 1 fibers. So you, you, you can do some strength training. You do, you do have some type 2 fibers, so you, you would see some improvement in muscle mass. And if you uh, have type 2 and you want to do some aerobic training, you do have type 1 fibers, so you can do aerobic training. And so I think overall it's getting something that you can do and you're comfortable doing for a very long time. And, and, and that's what I usually tell people. Right. Um, here's a, perhaps a more... Uh, um uh, a more physiological or biological question, excuse me, is there an infiltration of macrophages or other inflammatory changes, inflammatory changes that occur in muscle with aging? Yeah, we do detect um, immune cell infiltration into muscle with advancing age. And, um, you know, that can play an important role. We often think of inflammation and the immune cell infiltration as a bad thing, but it could be responding, responding to uh, minimal forms of damage, and uh, that's important for the repair. But as it lingers, it may be deleterious. So that, that's that's a little bit of a complicated biology to discuss here, but um, that's a, it's a really good question, and, and we do see increased macrophage and immune cell infiltration in aging muscle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 um, if anybody is familiar with Dr. Luigi Frigi, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study, you know they have been really preaching this this age of this chronic inflammation that that we are exposed to that. So that has some deleterious effect, and and if we can um, alter that with you know exercise interventions, um, that will sort of help take care of some of that issue that that we see as people age with this chronic inflammation. So it's getting that chronic inflammation down a little. Um, that some benefits. Great. There are a number of questions here about um, about sort of exercise regimens. You know, five days a week versus six days a week. One day off, one day, one day on. Um, how many? You know, for the elderly. Um, you know, how how much rest do they need in between? Um, could you comment a little bit about this sort of uh, again what what either your research or others research is saying about the the extent or the kind of exercise that is either recommended or or perhaps most most helpful in, uh, in helping people both start uh, to build muscle mass, but also perhaps to sustain that uh, muscle mass over time. So I, 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 I guess I can go first. Um, you know, what I would say is that there are a lot, there are a lot of, of, of protocols out there. There are a lot of people who think that, um, you know, different types of training uh, might be better for older, older individuals uh, as you know, one, one day off, two day on, um, high intensity versus low intensity, high intensity for a short period of time with a long rest. You know, they've all shown some, some benefits in some form. Um, a lot of these uh, are, 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 for lack of better terms, sort of new on the field. Um, so there's still a lot of research that's taking place to see, you know, what's, what's more beneficial for an old individual. Um, to me, it comes back to doing something that is, is something that you can sustain over a longer period of time. And if, if it's better for you to do, you know, one day exercise, rest for three days and do a day uh, or do high intensity um, every three, every two days or every other day. Um, the goal is to get you moving and moving at a, at a good enough intensity to see some benefits and for a sustained period of time. Um, that's the best that I can give right now. And Nathan has a different, what different answer. No, I, I would just comment that you know it's a very um, difficult question to answer for a group. There's really a personalized um, solution that needs to be found uh, for the current level of fitness and um, kind of what. An individual's goals might be. But again, I think Linda and I have both hinted at the fact that we worry about, again, we use this phrase older adults. What does that mean? I, I think that's everybody really that one, they're being um, not being challenged enough because of ageism or other concerns that they can't tolerate a higher intensity exercise intervention. And of course, there are exceptions to that where people have health conditions that may prevent um, training at a high intensity. But there's the other extreme too, and that's someone going in and really getting pushed too hard and having severe muscle um, soreness and discomfort that 
really discourages them from continuing in an exercise program. So it, it's kind of the, the intensity and the recovery bit has to be individualized. Um, that, and that is a challenge. Uh, we're coming up on 3.15, and again, we want to pre I want to appreciate Dr. LaVersera and Dr. Joseph for sticking around and answering a few of the questions that, are, that have come up. We apologize for not being able to get to all of your questions today. There's been a, there's been a, you know, a tremendous interest in this presentation and in, uh, and in, these, um, and in this topic more generally. Uh, we want to thank, once again, our sponsors, the American Federation for Aging Research, the uh, National Institute on Aging and the Go for Life Initiative and Next Avenue for, um, for supporting this. Um, and uh, we will be providing a link to the uh, webinar for folks who perhaps did not get to see all of it uh, or would like to share it with others uh, as, as a part of the follow-up. And uh, again, we appreciate your interest and in the topic and in the science of aging and, and look forward to seeing you next time uh, as, as part of our uh, ongoing series in, uh, in aging and scientific research. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone.